Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Khalees Smith. Later in the show, we'll head to Pittsfield to hang out with the awesome women of Latinas 413 to chat about the community ofrenda they'll be putting up for Dia de los Muertos at Hot Plate Brewing Company. And Mr. Universe, Hampshire College's Salman Hamid, discovering some parallels with the crisis in the Middle East and a short sci-fi film about a Palestinian astronaut. But right now, it is the penultimate day of October, and as Halloween, so when Dia de los Muertos and countless other celebrations converge, we head over to Holyoke to the Wisteria Hearst Museum, a place that is as full of local cultural connections as it is full of ghosts. Not real ones. As far as we can tell. But there were a lot of them. Yes, we have pictures. It was specifically for their darkened tours and Halloween. Yes. We are at the haunted Wisteria Hearst Museum right outside of downtown Holyoke. Megan Seiler. I'm the executive director here at Wisteria Hearst. So we are Holyoke's Museum and Gardens. We are an arts, culture, and history institution here in Holyoke. Um, We have a beautiful old mansion. We have a carriage house which stores our archives and the city archives here. And then we also have a beautiful garden for people to enjoy. Tell us a little bit about the history of this house. Whose house was this and how did it become the Museum Archive of Things Holyoke? Um, This house was originally built in the 1860s in Williamsburg, what's now Williamsburg, Massachusetts. When the big flood happened, it was moved here. Holyoke offered them, like, basically rent-free spaces on the canals for his factories or mills. And then they offered him the initial plot of land for $1. And so he moved his house from there to here. How did they do that back then? Um, I've seen them do it on big trucks. Oh, they they put it on a train. Wow. Some pieces were taken down by ox cart, which is a very, very wonderful image. But most of it was brought down by train Mm -hmm. and then pieced back together here. The daughter of William Skinner, who originally owned this house and was a silk mill owner, ended up inheriting the house and sort of made it her own. Uh, Pine Street used to be our original address, but that was no longer fashionable because a lot of the workers lived on that street. So she built a whole new entrance to change her a- address to Cabot um, because that's where all the fashionable Northampton people lived. Uh, so that's why we have a whole new entrance, new address. Um, and she also had an ex- a huge music collection. So she added on the big music room uh, that we're really known for as well. It's a big, beautiful space based off of Italian architecture. And uh, she was a well-traveled woman who uh, had places in New York and Paris, but she loved all things European, and so um, Italian architecture inspired this music realm. Can see it? you, Oh, yeah. And the place is decorated for Halloween right now, and so there are these silhouette cutouts in the windows that freaked me out when I was coming in here. I know, and I thought that some of them were you. Because they have these pork pie-style fedora hats or whatever. Yes. Now there are these headless mannequins wearing... Uh, period costumes. Those are also scary, but that might not be for Halloween. Is that just all the time? You know, we had them dressed for the 150th gala to celebrate Holyoke's anniversary, and they ended up not using them, so we thought, why not throw them in here for people to enjoy a little bit and to also kind of creep them out, because when the lights are low, it sort of looks like weird headless bodies floating in here. Yeah, it does. This looks like, a, you know, Roman architecture, Greek architecture. It's got columns, etc. She would just have musical performances in here? She would have them sometimes. Uh, it was mainly used to house her instruments. They ended up giving the music collection to Yale, um, but she had tons, and that, that cove right there used to have an organ. Um, she had an instrument that belonged to Marie Antoinette. It's an amazing collection. Wow. But this room was... Speaking of headless mannequins. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm bum. <laughs> she had drums, too. This here is the uh, Tiffany, what's thought to be a Tiffany window. It has a brother that lives upstairs because it was shot with a BB gun uh, right. back in the 80s. Is the other window also a peacock? Yes, it's the exact same thing, just, just mirrored mirror. over there. We don't know how complete it is at this point, so... You know, it's been sitting in boxes upstairs for since the 80s. But this one has been restored. We're hoping to Sunday get the other one restored. But um, they think this is a Tiffany window. Why do they think, not know? Um, we don't have any direct provenance that says that this is a Tiffany window. But they did have another Tiffany window commissioned, um, which is now at the Met. A lot of people claim to have Tiffany windows, but oftentimes they're not. But because they have a link to Tiffany in their other homes, it's quite possible that they did. So this Tiffany window doesn't think it's alone now? It's, uh, yeah. Two for two, Monty. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're alone now. Alone now. The peacock technically is alone now. And this is the dining room. 
Uh, this mantle here was a gift from Hatton Chatel, which was the small village in France that Belle Skinner helped rebuild after World War I. She was very much into philanthropy, especially after World War I. It was a pretty big thing for rich Americans to go over and help rebuild Europe. Uh, and that's her above there in the fabulous frock and animal stole. Gorgeous portrait. And then we have the butler's pantry over here, which is one of my favorite things, because you kind of get a, an idea of how kitchens developed. The, there's this beautiful little warming oven right there, which is quite unique. And we have a little pass through here. But I just, I love kitchens and I love talking about the people who worked here. <laughs> it's such a big mansion in such a tiny kitchen. Is there another kitchen? Oh, too? No, there's, there's a... more like the setup space, like, uh, like the, the kitchen's behind. And so they would yes. pass all the dishes through. This, yeah, the kitchen is no longer original. It was torn out in the 70s. So unfortunately, we do not have a beautiful kitchen to show people. I wish we did. <laughs> but we do have this amazing butler's pantry um, that kind of showcases how the butler would operate, you know, going back and forth in between the space and keeping the help invisible. <laughs> Which was Yikes. Their goal. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, you know, in a house that had its entrance moved so it wouldn't be with the riffraff. <laughs> yeah. What year did this no lo- was this no longer a residence and then became the museum itself? Uh, in 1959, this was donated by Kitty Skinner, another descendant of William, one of his daughters, and uh, it was given to the city to be like a cultural institution. Uh, so it was never meant to be a Skinner House museum. We're kind of working to decentralize their stories and talk a little bit more about Holyoke and the workers and, you know, who built their wealth and who built this city. Tomorrow is Halloween. We want to talk about whether this place is haunted or not. I mean... Megan? Again, do- again, my standing opinion is that every place in New England is haunted. <laughs> and mine is that it's not. Part of your Halloween celebrations, paranormal investigators who come and set up their gear in this building to try to ghost bust, essentially. Yeah, so we work with a really great group of people um, called the Spirit Sisters. The uh, the one of the head people is actually from Holyoke, and they come in usually once or twice a year and do a paranormal investigation after hours. And then at Halloween, they do kind of a presentation, and then they take people on different levels of the house and talk about their findings and what tools they used. And it's it's really quite interesting. Megan, you've been the executive director here for two years. What's your experience with the haunted nature of Wisteria Hearst Museum in Holyoke. Well, you know, this house makes a lot of noise. It's a little creepy here. And now that we're heading into winter, I tend to put my music on extra loud when it gets dark in here. So just in case there are creepy noises, I don't have to hear them. (laughs) But That's the way I think of it. There might be ghosts, but I don't want to know. But yeah, I just try my best not to creep myself out here. (laughs) What is the creepiest thing you've experienced in your time as a director of the Wisteria Hearst? Um, We had alarms going off in the middle of the night in areas where like people couldn't enter. And like motion sensor yeah. alarms? Yeah, so I was getting calls at all hours saying that someone had broken into the house. That was a little bit creepy. And then sometimes we'll get like weird smells in the house. And there's like no what? Like cigarette smoke, right? And I'll walk the grounds to see if somebody's like smoking. That was me. No, it no, was, like it, 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 it wasn't me. It was a ghost. No. <laughs> but like there'll be weird smells like that that'll pop up, and I always have to investigate just in case it's like an actual fire. Right. <laughs> and there's nothing to account for it. I mean, there's it, probably someone was just smoking outside, but it's still a little creepy. And I always say out loud, like, "Hey, listen, if you're living in my museum, just don't murder me." Like, if the- <laughs> you're dying in my museum, don't murder me. Also. <laughs> Do I have to die a smoker to smoke in the afterlife? Because if smoking is an afterlife option, I am definitely checking that box. Because what do you got to lose? If Beetlejuice has taught us anything, it's that, yes, you can smoke in the afterlife. (laughs) Sit down. Get in here. Close it. What else should we see here? Oh, the library is pretty good. All right. Um, We're going to do our own paranormal investigation in the library. Because as we all know from Ghostbusters, that is a good place to haunt. Metrical book stacking. Just like the Philadelphia Mass Turbulence of 1947. Always the library. Yeah. It's also a good place to murder somebody with a candlestick. I watch Whoa. a lot of Dateline. <laughs> okay, so these cobwebs are fake for Halloween, but it would be awesome if they were real cobwebs here. We have decorated for Halloween, so the ghost is also not real. Uh- <laughs> yeah, there's a, a bunch of scary things that are just here for Halloween, but they're not the actual ghosts that were, or if actual ghosts exist, they're not them. 
So yeah, this is the library. This was um, so this is the original entrance that I was telling you about. So this is where you would originally come where into. Where the hoi polloi would enter. <laughs> yes, and so this is where William Skinner would often hang out. He would receive people in here. His bedroom is the leather room, which is next to this, which I can show you as Hello. well. Hello. I don't care what you were into, William Skinner. I'm there for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Technically a family show, but you know, we can get into it. <laughs> Listen, you know what consenting adults do. Are yeah. these all original books from the, the Skinner era? or No, these are actually donated from the Skinner Coffee House. William Skinner's daughters created a, a coffee house where women who worked in the mills could meet. They did things like sewing. You could eat a meal there, learn like life skills. It was also a place where if you were dealing with domestic abuse, they would help take you in and get you back on your feet. And it was ran by, you know, other people into about the 70s. And the books that were at the Skinner House uh, are now, the Skinner Coffee House are now here. This <laughs> old Victrola, which is gorgeous, is it not playing on its own. <gasps> it does? Mm hmm Can you turn it on? Yeah. She's winding it up. This is one of my favorite things to show kids, and they're either really excited about it or they think it's the stupidest thing they've ever seen. <laughs> Why can't it, all of this music fit in my phone? Yeah, exactly. Killed a web. Yeah, of course, it would be Flight of the Valkyries. <laughs> <laughs> it could use a, a, it's a little dusty, but. <laughs> yeah. Maybe oh, a new so stylist funny. if he called him that for Victrola. I don't know. Soon we'll head to the Berkshires to celebrate Dia de los Muertos with the women of Hot Plate Brewing and Latinas 413. And we'll hear how politics and science echo each other with Mr. Universe. Next, we'll explore the second floor of the Wisteria Hearst Museum looking for ghosts. In all the wrong places. You're listening to the Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. We're touring the Wisteria Hearst Museum in Holyoke with its executive director, Megan Seiler. Here's what we're going to do. I know that paranormal investigators bring like recording equipment and they just let it run and see if any, I think they're called like electromagnetic something or others, interferences happen. So for Halloween, I'm just gonna let the tape run for a second to see if we hear anything spooky. If there are ghosts here, leave an electronic mark on this recording here in the library at the Wisteria Hearst Museum, please, now. Monty, did you come to Wisteria Hearst to make ghosts do tricks for you? Yes. <laughs> Could you get them to fix the boiler? Be helpful, ghosts. Yeah, if you're going to be here, then you make yourself useful. You <laughs> spiders, earn your keep. But yeah, and then this is the um, Williams bedroom over here. The leather room. Don't get me in trouble with my boss now. Is it the leather room because the wallpaper is leather? Mm hmm. Wow. Whoa! That's a commitment move. Was Tens amount. leather generally used as wallpaper often? It wasn't super common because it was exorbitantly expensive. Right. And it's all hand embossed and painted. It was basically just a really big, here's how much money I have. A major flex. Which is probably why it's in this room, not like the music room. <laughs> this was a Bell Skinner move. The irony is not lost on me that the Skinner family put <laughs> leather on their walls. <laughs> Well, let's we'll do the same thing where we'll let the tape run and see if there's a ghost close this door. and Skinner close it. See if any ghosts pick up on this recording. You didn't hear the creaks? I heard my stomach growl because I haven't had enough to eat yet today. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> we had a student once who came in and was like, it seems mean that there's a cow painting on a room that's covered <laughs> in leather. <laughs> yep. So yeah, I don't know if y'all want to go upstairs at all. Yeah, it'd be fun to check it out. Yeah, let's go. While we go up there, Megan Seiler, Executive Director of Wisteria Hearst, you do have some things that are going to happen tomorrow on Halloween here if people want to come. Yes, we are going to have the house open for trick-or-treaters, so you can come on by, and the uh, friendo will also be up, so you can come and trick-or-treat and get some candy from 4.30 to 6.30, I believe, we'll be here. Um, you can see the friendo, you can see the house kind of decorated, so that's a nice little fun way to come and celebrate, kick off your evening here, and you know, come say hi. Yeah. This is the kind of neighborhood that looks like they got full-size candy bars in it too. So maybe uh, come leave and pillage this neighborhood for their big candy bars. None of this fun size stuff. 
So it's, this is Stuart's bedroom. This is part of the addition. It has one of the best bathrooms in the house. Oh, nice. I'll use it. No. Okay. No, there's no water up here. I'll be the judge of it. Oh, wow. Wow, this is a glorious bathroom. The best part of the bathroom is that it has nine shower heads. Wow. Wow. That's a little excessive as most people only have one head. And I don't think nine people can fit in that little shower. Wait, this get built? This is in the 1920s. Wow. That's impressive. They actually used to have these amazing rib cage showers that would basically act like little water needles. And it was thought to help, you know, increase circulation and be therapeutic. It's incredibly painful. Yeah. <laughs> but we often think that some of these things are new technology, but in fact, they've been happening for a really long time and maybe we just didn't know about it. This is a room that we're reprogramming. It hasn't been open for like 20 years. So um, I'm doing a tenement style house in this room to talk about the workers' lives here in Holyoke. We have severe water damage in this room. And I thought, I don't have the money to fix it at this moment, but I can reinterpret it. So yeah. um, that's what's gonna be in here. Most of the time, this is like an educational space. We'll set up like classrooms up in here. But right now we have the MIFA Victory Mural uh, Theater Mural in here, and then we also made a great little photo op for people. <laughs> yeah, there is a couch that is surrounded by ghosts. I did see in like the, the welcome area of Wisteria Hearst some stuff that had to do with the Holyoke St. Patrick's Day Parade and the big wheeled, you know, front wheeled bicycle, and also the Victory Theater, which is something that the city of Holyoke is planning to bring back online. So tell us about this mural. Is this the actual mural from the, yes. the former Victory Theater? Yeah, so the Victory, the MIFA Victory Theater is actually not owned by the city at all. It's a private organization, and they are working on restoring the murals that go on either side, of, that went on either side of the stage. This is the top lunette for Victory, and this was one of the first pieces that they restored. And we just thought it would be great for the public to sort of learn a little bit about how art, works of art are conserved and sort of give them an idea of, of what it looked like and what we hope the Victory Theater will look like. Whose bedroom is this? Um, this was a family member's bedroom. Right now it's just a, an example of what Victorian bedrooms would look like. But yeah, we're hoping, you know, to, at some point this will be reprogrammed and maybe talk about the silk industry, you know, from beginning to end. So starting in Japan, which is where this family got a lot of their silk from, and what it took to get it all the way here. And uh, the women's work, like when women would buy the product, what they would turn it into. So either a decorative object or a dress or and have some of those on display to demonstrate how these products were used in the city of Holyoke. Um, this is Belle Skinner's bedroom. Uh, she loved being able to look at the garden through her window. It's a really great view. Oh yeah, those gardens are spectacular. We have an amazing group of gardeners that volunteer their time. A lot of them are part of the Master Gardeners Association of Western Mass, and they are so fantastic and dedicated to keeping the grounds looking beautiful. So we really appreciate all their efforts. And you can see why Belle would want to look out that window. We also have this amazing, I'd like to show people this. I'm, I'm a huge fan of creepy Victoriana. And oh, oh yeah, <laughs> a bunch of dead birds under glass, but beautiful ones. Are yeah. they real birds? Yes, they're, they're real birds. birds are real. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of them may even be extinct. I, that's one of the things I love about taxidermy. It's almost like a history lesson and like a biology lesson all in one. But the vignettes that they would create are just insanely spectacular. And the vivid colors that you're getting here are just wonderful. So a lot of people are creeped out by it, but I find it just really charming and interesting. So I always like to show people that piece. That's what you have to say, so the ghosts leave you alone. <laughs> yes, this is oh. one of our favorites. We don't know the code to this safe. <laughs> <laughs> There's a safe in a closet where you could hang your coats and also put your valuables, I suppose. Yes, they did have someone break in at one point and they put the safe in to try and protect their belongings. But now we don't know the code, uh, so. Have you tried one, two, three, four? You know, I have tried one, two, three, four, and it has not worked, um, but. We always let people attempt to open it, and if they do, then, you know. You know there's got to be safe crackers that are out there that'll be able to... There's got to be someone, but, you know, the mystery is Don't trust fun. white people. There are no safe crackers. <laughs> this is our elevator here. So this was put in later. Whoa! I can hear it. Yeah, it's still fully operational. That's super cool! Put in for the when museum purposes or when people were still no, living No, when people here? were still living here. Oh. So it's, it's not ADA compliant, but you can yeah, still use it. Like it's better than uh, most old houses. Oh, it's like old this. school! This is like an old school, like with the grate and all that. That's amazing. Yeah. It's a lifesaver at times when you're taking things from the basement up yeah. and down. and. It's also kind of creepy. 
Yeah, I have a couple of staff members who refuse to get on this elevator. Oh, ghosts. <laughs> well, or maybe because of mechanical issues. Yeah. Surrounding I mean, how old it is. Look, are they mutually exclusive? Well, it gets checked like twice a year, so. It also gets checked for ghosts twice a year, so there you go. It does. You know, we've never found paranormal, they've never found any paranormal activity on that elevator. Where's the most paranormal activity in the house, according to your paranormal investigators? Well, I would say probably Stuart's bedroom, that first room at the second floor that we went into. This staircase is quite amazing. As you walk up it, the peonies bloom, and it is quite a unique piece to this house. So the railing, yeah, the, yeah uh, along the railing, underneath it, the decorative, you can see the buds get bigger as you go up the staircase. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah, so cool. It's such a unique work of art, and it's just, you know, we have weddings here, and this is just such a great centerpiece for photographs, and it's just a really dramatic, amazing staircase. One more time on Halloween, people want to come by, trick or treat, and get a little glimpse into the spooky, decorated, amazing history of this Wisteria Hearst Museum in Holyoke. When are you going to be uh, doing that? So we're going to be doing that on, on Halloween from 4.30 to 6.30 for trick-or-treaters. And then on November 1st, the Afrenda will be open from 5 to 7 at night. And then again on the 2nd from 11 to 1. So you can come by either on your lunch break or in the morning and check it out and make sure you don't miss it. Do you have a scavenger hunt for all the ghosts in the museum? No. <laughs> Good idea for next year. <laughs> yes, and we always have house tours. Um, usually we do a dozen house tours of the first and second floor once a month. So always check our website, wisteriahearse.org, for that if you want to come and get a really great guided tour from us and, and see more of the house. And lots of other like really cool events happening pretty oh, much yeah. Yeah, all the time. Like really Classes cool. and talks and all sorts of really fun things happen here. Yeah, we're really lucky. We have so many great community partners and scholars, and you know we just like to take advantage of that whenever we can and give them space to share their artwork or their you know research and we're just really lucky one last chance to show yourselves on audio ghosts i didn't hear anything did you <laughs> Although you've missed the official darkened tours at Wisteria Hearst Museum, there's lots of events happening there constantly, including their ofrenda for Dia de los Muertos, which we'll talk about with the organizers, Johan Rashi Vega and Jason Montgomery, tomorrow on the show. And speaking of Dia de los Muertos, up next we'll head to the Berkshires to find out how the folks of Hot Plate Brewing Company and Latinas 413 are collaborating for their own celebration and ofrenda in Pittsfield. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 and EPM. When I introduced it to, to Mike, he, he was like, oh, my grandfather would always sit, listen to opera, have scotch and pistachios. So that was like that, that day for him. That's, I mean, he's like, okay, pull my leg to drink scotch and eat pistachios. <laughs> yeah, right. yes. so it's just about yeah. celebrating yes. it your own way. You know, yeah. you, you don't have to go through a, you know, a whole production. You can go in if you want, or go to the books to check yeah. what water means, what salt and light and having the flowers. Go ahead. Yeah, if that's what you need, I mean, yeah. it's okay. But I think traditions evolve, and also we're immigrants in a new country and adopting and creating also. We're at Hot Plate Brewing in Pittsfield, the only Latino-owned brewery in the 413 that we know of, with the owner and brewer. What's your name? Hello, I'm Sarah Rael. And are you officially part of Latinas 413? I believe I am. If there are dues to be paid, then I haven't done them. And I are no, <laughs> what we learned last time is there are no dues to be paid. Are you allowed to pay dues to a nonprofit? And we are here with the Latinas from Latinas 413, Laura, America, Liliana, and Tanya. Three out of, I don't know what you your background is, Sarah, but I know three out of four of the Latinas here are Mexican. Dia de los Muertos is a holiday that is celebrated in Mexico, and here at Hot Plate in Pittsfield, they will also be celebrated on November 1st. What can we bring for the altar or the ofrenda we're going to have here? Can we bring like our own pictures, food, or what can we bring? Can we bring booze to Yeah, can we bring outside booze into your, into your brewery? <laughs> Probably, un yeah, from your country unopened, and then, you know, once we close, late night party. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here. Tell us what's going to happen as part of 
the Dia de los Muertos celebration. So we have a couple of partnerships that we're bringing in for this whole event. First is with these lovely ladies. Latinas um, World Wonder. Right, and they are doing, we're doing some chocolate calaveras. Little but, skulls. Yeah, little skulls. Then we are partnering with Tito's Mexican Restaurant, which is down the street. You can order from them and they'll deliver the food here. Nice. Then we are also working with a historical society, um, but we are going to talk about thinking about the history because, you know, the day is about remembering people and, you know, both anyone across the family and bringing pictures of them and foods they liked and things like that. So for us, it's because we're trying to understand the history of Pittsfield. We're having a community ofrenda. So we're going to... Uh, an altar? Yeah, altar. So we're going to clear out one of the bookcases so people can bring their own pictures of what they want, but work with the historical society and things like that. Pictures of old downtown Pittsfield. So it can be like, let's remember what it was and let's continue to go through, you know, and celebrate what it was and bring that celebration to the forefront. What is Latinas 413 going to be bringing to this Dia de los Muertos celebration on November 1st at Hot Plate in Pittsfield. Very fun activity. And it's sweet. As chocolate skulls, we're going to be decorating. You're more than welcome to come stop by on my little table that I'm going to have. Put your name on the skull, keep it. You can keep it for the rest of the holiday or you can eat it here. Why are skulls an important part of the celebration? To honor the death. Everyone has their own interpretation. I embrace this tradition here. But it's not something that you grew up doing? No. And I think it was something we talk about among us, like you embrace more your culture and your roots when you have, and you are in a new place and you have something to compare and you're actually, oh, by the way, I actually enjoy that. You know, the candy, the tamales, the yeah. atole, the chocolate, it was good. So I didn't grow up with this. I adopted and I accept it. Yeah. It's interesting because you guys talk about Dia de los Muertos. We, in Ecuador, we do have it, but for us it's going to the cemetery and we'll bring like our own food. The main thing that we have are called guaguas. Kind of look like kids made of bread, kind of cookies. Yeah. Um, that, and then the other one is called colada morada. It's like a purple drink that we will bring remembering the dead, but we will go with the family to the actual place where we bury them. So when they kind of celebrate, I'm like, yeah, in a way we connect, but it's a little different. Yeah. America? I grew up uh, celebrating the, uh, the Dia de Muertos, and it was like with my mother, my grandmother. We used to travel with my mother to see my grandmother, and my grandmother used to make mole. She used to make different kinds of food, and we put all the food together, and candies. We have uh, candles, we have flowers, and then the smell of the flower, that have, I, I miss that. Uh -huh. my country that smell that feeling that connection and thinking like oh my grandfather he's gonna be here at the middle of the night so that was so beautiful I would love my my kids they go to Mexico and it, you can celebrate here but it's never gonna be the same feeling right yeah. what about you what's your relationship to Dia de los Muertos like Laura my family used to put like an ofrenda so I grew up in the city but my mother and my father grew up in a in a village and the small villages are very connected to Catholicism, right? So the other de los Muertos comes from Catholic uh, religion. So I feel like that's why Liliana, you were not that connected because no. you were not Catholic, right? I was Protestant. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. That's why. Yeah, I grew up Protestant, so I was not as connected. But I feel like some traditions are like, like you just forget that they come from something, right? An ofrenda is like a commemoration of the dead. Period. Like if you really go into uh, like an ofrenda, there's a lot of meaning from the incienso, salt water, the candles, the flowers, like everything has a meaning. And I feel like when you like really look into that, you realize how beautiful an ofrenda is. There's a really interesting relationship between like Americans and death, where we really don't talk about it until we have to. Except on Halloween, yeah. where, <laughs> where it's apparently totally cool for 24 hours to just talk about death and the things that happen. But this in a long series of other cultures' relationships with death seems much healthier to at least like acknowledge and recognize it. Do you feel that you've seen that difference? I mean, that, that was in Ecuador, you know, like yeah. anyone, like we will do that. We'll have a little tradition. We'll have keep the body for like three days. 
we'll pray and like we'll remember them and then eventually like we'll go like we'll walk together and then bring it to like the place that they're gonna rest and it was a whole like journey and then after that we'll take all their clothes wash their clothes and then like yeah like a month we'll do like a celebration of a a month has passed then a yearly thing but when I came here I do have a, my stepbrother to pass away and it was basically like that I was like okay you know you rest in peace that was it and we never went back so that was something that I think I was missing I don't know I think I read somewhere I cannot remember about uh, how death is a sign that there was life I don't see Day de, uh, Dia de los Muertos as a, a celebration of death that's how many people understand Dia de los Muertos that's a, that's a celebration of life and actually there's a place in Mexico uh, which is called Mitzkik which it's uh, translated as uh, Ciudad de los Muertos and it's this place where people go to celebrate the dead and if you look at pictures you'll see like lights just lights 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 flowers and people it's like a party people go to a, a cemetery to have a party you were asking if we have a healthy relationship to that i don't know if that's accurate cause i don't feel like we just take it as okay it's part of life right it's just a sign that there was life Death is hard for anybody, right? Nobody wants to see any uh, anybody that we love going away and not being able to see them. But we commemorate the life and when that person was present and how we relate to that person and what the person did for us or what we did for them or the moments that we share. And I feel like that's Dia de los Muertos. It's just like cherishing those moments and knowing that one day we are going to be dead too and it's part of life. So if you have a memory, if you mention their name, they are alive, they are still part of us and they want to believe that that day they come back here, they enjoy their food, they still are part of our memory so they are still alive. Honoring and celebrating that is beautiful. Besides Polke, are you doing another beer for this event? I am not doing another beer for this event, but we probably will still have the jalapeno pale ale on. And then we also have uh, micheladas on top. So yeah, so we have the, the cream ale, the rock and the gold tooth, and some michelada mix. And it's my favorite drink ever. So, yeah. mm, tasty. Everybody is welcome, even if you're not Latino or part of Latinas 413, to this Absolutely. Dia de los Muertos yep. celebration here in Pittsfield at Hoplite. Yes, and it's and it's about, you know, for me, because I didn't really grow up with it, but I kind of did. And then the way I would always celebrate is my grandmother always loved Chinese food. So, like, my husband and I would go to, like, the greasiest Chinese food. Like, there are fabulous ones out there. Oh, my God, I love them. Yeah, and I was just like, this is what she wants. So we would have it, and it was that kind of thing. Like, I just thought about her, like, sitting at the table with us. Yeah. You know, so it's just kind of that, that celebration of where to, wherever it is. My Italian grandmother also loved greasy Chinese yes. food. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody loves greasy Chinese food. My grandmother couldn't have it because she couldn't have salt. Like, oh. Oh. What is it for you guys, Dia de los Muertos? How do you interpret it? Well, it's a wonderful thing to observe, but I do that on the day that my grandmothers died and then on their birthdays. I have no relationship historically to Dia de los Muertos, but like I always go back to my grandmother, who's like the person who I lost, who has the biggest impact on me still. Whenever I cook food that she cooked, or especially like Christmas Eve, which was the big Italian celebration of food and all that, that's kind of like my Dia de los Muertos. Here's the, I guess my last Dia de los Muertos question. The movie Coco, the Disney movie. Oh, this is another one of those moments where radio is the wrong medium for what just happened. What's your feelings about Coco? Tanya. Maha, we offered that movie. We went out and they put a display outside, so we were in our cars and we watch it with my brother and my friend, close friend, and we, we cried. Okay. We definitely cried. cried them, but, but it was, it was amazing. <laughs> everybody was amazing. America? It was just no, I, I feel everybody cried with that movie. But you know what was beautiful about that movie? <laughs> that they showed a dog, Sholo Squintly, and actually they kept, they kept it like very accurate. So I was like, okay, very thankful for that. Wow. Yeah. I'll let, I'll let Laura answer and then I'll go oh, ask. Yeah. I'll go okay. ask. Well, I went to the movie theaters with my son and I was like crying and crying. And he wasn't crying and I was, he asked me, why are you crying? <laughs> because I really have that connection. I remind me when I was little, but I really, I was crying, yeah. Liliana, you get the last word on Coco. For those who don't know, Coco's a Disney movie about the Day of the Dead. 
Exactly. This is going to be a weird <laughs> answer, but... It, it's just Weirder the better. I cry, too. My girls cry. We'll love it. But also, I think it touches into my Mexican pride and understanding, like, Dia de los Muertos comes not just now as a big thing with it, La Catrina, pre-Hispanic. There is pre-Hispanic history there. Celebration. I remember in school doing a contest for the best ofrenda. And we did one with bones and sand and corn and understanding the meaning. So it goes way back, you know, what we're doing and what we're celebrating. And now it's, it's and traditions are that excuses to get together and have fun and eat and boost. But yeah, I guess it touches that too. I am very proud of Mexican and all the history of what we bring. But I think that's the idea with all this, like you are offering our, your place to reach out to the community. But yeah, you don't connect with the Dia de los Muertos, but you know like in some way as a community we can come in, support, listen to your stories, laugh about it, cry about it together. And I think that's the beauty. And I hope everybody shows up. I think this is huge. Just to connect the community, I think that's that's that will be a huge thing for uh, all of us to get together. Yeah. Enjoying some nice Cheers. 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 Salud. Remember me. You can find more information about the Dia de los Muertos events happening at Hot Plate Brewing Company in Pittsfield on their website, and we'll link to that on the podcast. Coming up, Hampshire College astronomer Dr. Salman Hamid on how astronomy can offer a global perspective on our shared humanity, even in a time of international crisis. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. To boldly go where no man has gone Time before. for some more kitchen table, astronomy, film critique... <laughs> And politics with our resident astronomer, Hampshire College astronomer, Dr. Salman Hamid, Mr. Universe, member of the Amher Cinema Board. And it has been a very hard few weeks for people who love other human beings with what's been going on in Gaza. This is something that you wanted to talk about today. Why? As a human being, I want to talk about this. I mean, there are multiple reasons why I wanted to talk about it. And it's it's a little weird, at least for one week, like, you know, to talk about space and completely be detached from what is happening in the Middle East. I mean, it can be an escape, but sometimes you do have to face what is happening. So the pale blue dot that Sagan's aspect was like, you know, and or blue marble earth and stuff like that, that, well, all of these things, if you look in a cosmic perspective, I mean, it's bizarre that humans do what humans have been doing. You don't see boundaries. We live for such a short period of time. Humans been around for a few hundred thousand years. If you add early humans, you can add a few million years on a time frame of four and a half billion years of the planet. We are most likely not going to be here for very long. So we are just a blip and yet we come in and we do atrocities. So there is that element to it, which in some ways we can talk about and we just did and move on. As you know, I also have a channel, a YouTube channel, both for this stuff also, but also for uh, South Asia. And I just got a comment today, this morning. It was in Urdu, but the person said, I'm so glad that at least for 15 to 20 minutes, my videos are that long once a week that comes out, I can leave behind this pain and suffering that we are seeing on earth and think about something else. And normally I would have taken that. I was like, yeah, thank you very much, that kiddo. But frankly, sometimes you do have to face the pain and suffering and talk about it. People are dying. Right. And, you know, just having a distraction off the cosmic perspective, which usually it's great for humility, great for shooting down self-esteem, but it should not be a distraction. So that's one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about it. I mean, we've been wrestling with this uh, as the fabulous 413. Obviously, Western Mass is far from the Middle East, but so many people that we encounter day in and day out, be they Jew, be they Muslim, be they protesters, they are wrestling with these huge humanitarian issues. I drove by Congressman McGovern's office on Friday. There was a huge pro-Palestinian rally with dozens of people there. We talk to the congressman about it from a political perspective every week, but we haven't really wrestled with the human perspective. I talked to two of my friends who were Israeli Jews yesterday, and they're devastated not only because of how it felt when so many Jews were killed and kidnapped, but also because of what 
the Israeli government is now doing in Gaza. We are all as human beings wrestling with this. And you, who grew up Muslim in Pakistan, I'm sure are wrestling with this in your own way. Right. And 9-11 is brought up multiple times uh, in terms of this is Israel's 9-11. And Biden also, when he went over there, he said, well, I mean, apart from some of the things that I don't agree with what Biden said, but one thing he did say was you should learn lessons from how U.S. reacted to it, which was not the most productive way. One of the things that I remember, I remember because I had to do it, was a registration. As a Muslim, so this was a program called National Entry Exit Registration System that was created after 9-11, newly formed uh, Homeland Security did that under President Bush. And it was designed for all males between 16 to 45, I think, and if they belong to certain countries, and they had 25 countries out of which 24 were Muslim countries, which included Pakistan as well, that we had to go and register. And that registration included giving your social security card, giving them photocopies of that, your credit cards, photocopies of that, your debit cards, and having an interview. In Boston, you had to go to so Boston. I had to go to Boston. They actually sent me a letter. A letter came out and they said, well, uh, your appointment is at eight in the morning in Boston on a certain date. And they said that we expect you to be there unless you have a very good reason you cannot be there. Mm -hmm. I was a postdoc at Smith College at the time, uh, Smith and UMass. And that's what I did. So I was like, you know, I'm in academia. I'm a much more privileged situation. And I went there and the interview was fine. But I can, as you can imagine, how intimidating it could have been. About 100,000 people, I think, at least registered for that. A bunch of people got deported as well. A lot of people actually went, left the country because of this program as well. Uh, but this program discontinued in 2011. And in 2016, before Trump took over the presidency, President Obama asked to dismantle the records of that program because what he worried about was the kind of rhetoric that President-elect Trump was using about the Muslim ban, which he did institute, and again, that was selective to certain countries, that he may use end up using the list and information of people who were, got registered for this program. And so he asked to sort of like, you know, dismantle the information. And right now there is a similar talk going on. Presidential candidate Trump and DeSantis and Tim Scott, they all have come out and have said that if they come to power, they are going to cancel visas for students who are, for example, participating in these protests, right? And then there is a slippery language because they are supporting terrorists. But what constitutes protest? Because protesting is oftentimes, it's also right now about ceasefire. A lot of the protests are talking about humanitarian pause. They are threatening to do a similar thing that has happened before. And university administrations, college administration administrators, they are struggling with that. And they should, but they should struggle on the side of free speech. Right? I mean, I mean, I can imagine. I mean, if I was a student right now on a student visa, I would be worried. I would be terrified. But of course, you put that in context with the number of people dying, number of children dying in Gaza. That's what the perspective that you have to pick in. And know that University of Massachusetts had protest and it ended up with arrests with, with f over 50 students that got arrested. There um, has been a chilling effect in academia as well in response to people's perspectives on the conflict between Israel and, and Hamas right now. In fact, there is a prominent editor-in-chief of eLife Journal. Uh, he just got fired. Michael Eisen is his name. He's Jewish. You know, you have to add that thing, right? I mean, right. you have to add. And this is, again, in terms of the context, the kind of language that you have to use. And he got fired because he shared a, an article from the satirical magazine, The Onion. There was a story with the headline, Dying Gazans Criticized for Not Using Last Words to Condemn Hamas. Now, that's pretty biting. Uh, so Michael Eisen tweeted this particular article, and he said, The Onion speaks with more courage, insight, and moral clarity than the leaders of every academic institutions put together. I wish there were an Onion University. He got actually pushback for that. And then he actually wrote back a day later. So this is important in that context. He actually said, 
Every sane person on earth is horrified and traumatized by what Hamas did and wants it to never happen again. All the more so as a Jew with Israeli family. But I am also horrified by the collective punishment already being meted out on Gazans and the worst that is about to come. The Onion is not making light of the situation, and nor am I. These articles are using satire to make a deadly serious point about this horrific tragedy. And Eisen ended up losing his job because of this? Yes. He, so he got fired. He was asked by the board to politely to resign, mm -hmm. and he refused. And he said that, no, you'll have to fire me. And it's not just him, but a bunch of other editors have, uh, from uh, this journal have resigned as well. If you just look at this statement, okay, I mean, that's not, I don't want to get fired either. But, <laughs> but, but to me, this seems like a very reasonable statement. Again, connecting it to the larger politics. I mean, I did mention the GOP candidates. The actions of our government has, like, you know, we have to be responsible as well because those tax dollars that go in, wherever they are being used, we are part of that. In that context, it is the U.S. that vetoed the U.N. General Assembly resolution for a humanitarian pause, for which overwhelmingly there was support for that in United Nations. You have Gaza, which is one of the most densely packed places on earth, and half of the population is under whatever 20 or so and there is collateral going on to which by the way president biden recently said that i have no notion that the palestinians are telling us the truth about how many people uh, are killed i'm sure innocents have been killed and it's the price of waging a war this is a statement by president biden and as you can imagine the same statement can be used for many different ways to justify the killing of innocent people many different ways. And so instead of pushing for a ceasefire, we have gone the opposite way. And this is one of those things, there are stories that are coming out that a lot of Muslims and Arab support for President Biden, which was crucial for especially states like Michigan, is slipping away. Speaking with Hampshire College astronomer, Dr. Salman Hamid, Mr. Universe, we usually talk about astronomy and films, and we have referenced that both astronomy and films can be an escape. And before we end this conversation, there is a beautiful artistic film that has to do with space and astronomy that people might want to watch during this time. Because when I feel confused and afraid and sad, I turn to the arts for healing. And you have a, a film recommendation, a short, wonderful, beautiful film. Again, normally I would have said, hey, watch 2001 Space Odyssey. But this, to the, this day and age and with TikTok, generation, I think that would be hard to do. It's a long film. It's a long film. It's a beautiful film. And yeah, that one of right. my top films of all time. There you go. But it is a five minute film. It's a short film. It is called A Space Exodus. It's from 2008. It's by a Palestinian artist, uh, Larissa Sansur. She actually did a trilogy of films uh, about Palestinian plight, various ways, and again, artistic way. But A Space Exodus is deeply inspired by 2001 Space Odyssey. In fact, the music is beautiful because the music has uh, the same 2001 uh, Space also Odyssey. Rock Zarathustra. That's exactly right. And also uh, the Blue Danube. But it has a little Arabic tinge to that. And so that's wonderfully done. It starts with sort of like this astronaut, uh, which is played by uh, uh, Larissa Sansur herself. She's getting close to the moon and she says, Jerusalem. Uh, we have, we a, have problem. a problem. And uh, then she actually gets to the moon and plants a flag, which is a Palestinian flag. And she says, this is one small, small step for a Palestinian, one giant leap for mankind. The short film continues and towards the end, it reminded me more, a little bit more like David Bowie, uh, where you have this astronaut out in space going into oblivion. That's what the movie is, but it's beautiful, it's appropriate. This is not an escape, but I think this is ni a nice reflective piece of about what it's going on. And I said reflective piece and immediately I was like, oh, and it should be about the other type of peace as well. All I would say towards the end is ceasefire, if nothing else right now is essential. Ceasefire should not be that controversial. Student visas should not be canceled to protest against the killing of thousands of children. 
tomorrow on the fabulous 410. Oh, sorry. If you're curious about the film that Salman Hamid mentioned, we'll post links to that in our podcast this evening. It's but been a Monday. It has been for sure. <laughs> Tomorrow on The Fabulous 413, we'll discover some of the ghosts, cryptids, and other spookies of the 413 with folklorist and author Jeff Belanger. And we'll get ready to honor our ancestors on Dia de los Muertos with Johan Rashi Vega and Jason Montgomery, who together are building three public ofrendas to both engage with the community and honor those we've lost. Special thanks to Spouse, Happy Valley Guitar Orchestra, Jerry Goldsmith, Tiffany, I guess Wagner, the Royal Op- <laughs> Opera, Louis Angel Gomez Hamar- Harami, Benjamin Bratt, Star Trek, Ada Nadim, and Steve Earl. I'm Kali Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. We'll see you tomorrow on the Fabulous 413.